Uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, I want to begin actually with a, a thank you to our elder, or the elder, uh, Dave. I don't know if he's still around, but um, I want to honor uh, the elder and, and for his generosity um, this week, taking us for a walk uh, on what you call country here. Um, and sharing his knowledge and taking on a really great responsibility in this country as one of many elders to uh, bestow that knowledge onto uh, general Australians. Um, it's a big task, and um, uh, it's been a pleasure working with him. I also wanted to thank Andrew and, uh, and Sam and the, and the team for such a warm hospitality this week. It's really been a, a, an amazing week. So. So in the context of talking about infrastructures of life, uh, it's such a big question, and, uh, and I had like 300 slides originally, and so, but what I tried to do is sort of focus on my own reflections on where we are um, in architecture in Canada, I think, at least where I think where we are, and more and more globally, and just share my thoughts and reflections on this without any real answers uh, to this question of what indigeneity means uh, uh, to design. But uh, the title of this is Towards a, a Critical Relationalism, and this is a drawing done by students of our, our, one of the projects that I've worked on related to the Venice Biennale, and I'll touch on that later. In Canada, it's critical as an Indigenous person to first uh, introduce yourself and where you're, your kin and your family relations. So I first want to honour my mom's family, who's a second-generation Austrian-Canadian. Uh, so often when I'm talking, uh, there's uh, an emphasis on my dad's family and my indigeneity, but I also want to honor my mom's family. Uh, but when I speak on indigenous issues, I'm speaking to my, my dad's family, um, and um, this is him and his brothers and sisters, my grandmother, uh, and my dad's on the bottom left of the le bottom left image, um, and with my uncle Ed, who a, was a chief of uh, uh, Halfway River First, or Half... I always forget the name of the, of the First Nation where he was at, a chief in northern um, BC. But the reason why I like to show this is I was raised, my dad is an educator, and uh, was very much in the 1990s uh, working with communities across Alberta primarily, talking about indigenous sovereignty and self-determination over education. And I often say to him, now you were like 30 years ahead of your time because now you'd, a lot of your work would have landed on open ears, uh, where it was a bit of a struggle in earlier generations. Uh, and he was featured in this book, uh, My Heroes Have Always Been Indian. So to say, as an architect, I, come f I grew up around a dinner table where these issues were constantly in conversation about self-determination and indigenous rights. As Andrew alluded to, in Canada, since our Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was finished in 2015, there was a report published um, uh, with uh, a number of calls to action for the, can for the country. Uh, now we're eight years later, and over the last couple of years, it's kind of, I've come to this realization that Indigenous is kind of in, in fashion in Canada, and um, this is a really important step in Canadian architectural history, something many of us have been advocating for for a long time, but now we have our big major firms are, are all sort of taking this on, um, everybody's marching ahead, and uh, there's now not a public or municipal or provincial project uh, that doesn't ask uh, the design team to factor in indigenous teachings or values or, you know, some, some input. So this is really kind of a comprehensive shift in architectural history, in my mind, in our country, as it seems to be headed towards here. So these are all great examples of indigenous and non-indigenous architects working together. Um, there's hundreds more, of course. Um, but I'm a bit haunted by this quote. Um, by a Hawaiian theorist, uh, Poka Loenui, uh, and this is where he's describing what colonization is and how it performs, and this is his final stage of colonization. So this is when indigenous people have been basically taken over by the colonizers. He says, the traditional culture that simply refuses to die or go away is now transformed into the culture of the dominating colonial society. Indigenous art that has survived may gain in popularity and form the basis for economic exploitation. Indigenous symbols and print may decorate modern dress. Indigenous musical instruments may be incorporated into modern music. Supporting indigenous causes within the general colonial structure may become the popular political thing to do, exploiting the culture further. This exploitation can be committed by indigenous as well as non-indigenous peoples. So in all of our enthusiasm, every once in a while, this quote always reminds me to kind of stop and pause, and I think we're at a moment uh, in Canada and, and here where you have to kind of say, like, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> what, what, is, 
What is our intent? Are we clear on what we're doing and, and how are we doing it in a good way? Which is a phrase that a lot of First Nations people in Canada use of doing things in a good way from, from your heart. So I want to frame this kind of questioning uh, through our country, two different identity crises. Well, the first one is more simple than the second one, but this one's more simple. In Canada, we had an identity crisis uh, following our uh, um, establishment as a country in 1867 of who Canada is. Uh, we had two colonial groups that fought over our territories as opposed to Australia, so we had British and French colonial uh, communities in Canada. And when the country was formed, of course, we were under British rule, but we have Quebec and we have French as a second language. So even when it came down to thinking about what should the flag of Canada be, if you're wondering why there's no Union Jack, it's because the French wouldn't ever allow that. Um, we had to find something much more neutral. But the conversation had always been, are we more French or are we more English? Should we uh, uh, look more like Britain or the United States or should we look more like f France? And this really, over the decades of the 20th century, led to a crisis at the mid-century where uh, the federal government commissioned the Massey Report. Um, and this was a, a multi-year project where a, a, a very prominent figure in Canadian history, Vincent Massey, went across the country and they interviewed everyone. And the crisis was, Canada has no culture. Canada has no culture. We have to define who Canada is as a country. We have to be different than the United States. We have to be different than Britain. So who are we? Um, and so this led to this idea of a national, a single national program, and it led to the foundation of the Canada Council for the Arts, for instance, who funds almost all of the artistic endeavors that the country does. It basically leads to us being in the Venice Biennale and other things like that, all on this idea of Canadian nationalism. Not too long after that, in architectural theory, many of you are architects probably read uh, some of this stuff throughout your studies on critical regionalism, which was a movement in the 70s and 80s that sort of questioned the idea of universal architecture, right? Kind of like the white box that can land in any country and doesn't matter where it is. Um, and there was a resistance to that. The resistance was, why can't we design with our spatial thinking expertise in a way that responds to the land where we are, right? So you have climate-specific uh, architecture, people celebrating architects around the world who are sensitive to place. And Kenneth Frampton kind of took this from Lefebvre and Zonis and ran with that theory of critical regionalism. Um, in Canada, uh, Brian McKay Lyons was one of our most critically regionalist uh, acclaimed architects, um, and still is. In fact, he's going to be designing the Canadian Embassy here in, in, uh, in Australia, in Canberra, soon. He's started. Um, but he, here's a quote from, Kenneth Fram or from uh, Brian saying, Kenneth Frampton's critical regionalist thesis has enabled our resistance in the face of a numbing cultural influence of globalization. So some of you in the crowd probably recognize the fellow on the left of this image, which is Glenn Merkitt, which is Australia's own critical regionalist acclaimed internationally architect. So you have a group of architects uh, of the time that are finding out how to use contemporary design in a very regionally specific and sensitive way. Now, Frampton starts off his very famous essay on this, which was called Towards a, a Critical Regionalism, which is what the title of my talk is playing off of. Um, and he starts off with a Recur uh, quote that I want to read that Recur at the time was talking in the 60s about this. He said, no one can say what will become of our civilization when it has met different civilizations by means other than the shock of conquest and domination. But we have to admit that this encounter has not yet taken place at the level of an authentic dialogue. That is why we can no longer practice the dogmatism of a single truth and in which we are not yet capable of conquering the skepticism into which we have stepped. We are in the tunnel at the twilight of dogmatism and the dawn of re real dialogue. So there's been a really interesting intent of this idea of Western uh, sort of uh, thinking uh, in, in different contexts. So going back to Frampton, one thing about Frampton is prior, before he was kind of the voice of critical regionalism, he was a, an editor for architectural design in the 1960s. And he had kind of taken on this mandate of showing the world basically modern architecture in what he termed as peripheral situ situations. So he became very interested in different countries around the world showing where modernism was responding to place. Um, you can see uh, your flag on there. Um, and Sweden and all these places that were perceived not to be the center. But of course, if you define something by the periphery, you're implying a center. <laughs> and some of the people who are in those locations think of themselves as a center. Like, why are we on the periphery of your world? So what is this notion of periphery and centralization in, in, in architectural thinking? 
In Canada, going back to the Massey report of who is Canadian identity, our own flag in this kind of nationalist architectural mode, uh, this is a quote directly from the Massey report when they finally brought up indigenous people. This is like on page 80 of 160 or whatever it is. It is argued that the Indian arts emerged naturally from that combination of religious practices and economic and social customs which con constituted the culture of the tribe and the region. The impact of the white man with his more advanced civilization and his infinitely superior techniques resulted in the gradual destruction of the Indian way of life. So this is written into the founding cultural document of Canadian culture that basically indigenous art was part of arts and craft. They kind of give it some, a little bit of funding to go into museums, but in terms of a contemporary vision for Canada moving forward, not relevant, according to the Massey Report. Um, and this is important because there were 900 buildings um, done. I'm going to just uh, go ahead. Well, no, I'm going to go back, sorry. There were 900 buildings built in the 1960s towards our centennial, all sort of aspiring to represent Canadianism. Um, and uh, so architecture was much a part of this, uh, this conversation. So there's critique of this, and if you think back to now putting what crit critical regionalism is, it's a, it's a design process whereby you are sensitive and responsible to the land where you are, that makes sense. But some of the critique comes to this idea of nationalism. So for instance, the most acclaimed critical regionalists are people like Tadeo Ando for Japan, Niemeyer in Brazil, Korea for India, Baragan in Mexico. Um, and and if, these are, this is one person, Keith Egner and others, who have looked at this and started to say, if you trace where their architectural thinking is coming from, where they are trained, what their influences are, these aren't exactly grassroots developed architectures. They are often ideologically coming from other places. Um, and so they, are they of the place? Are they kind of in, in a kind of vernacular or spirit of place? Or are they actually still imposed as a style, but Frampton loved this because it was sort of... Uh, Frampton and the critical regionalists were also critically, uh, critical of the postmodernists, so the idea of symbol symbology, which is very kitsch, right, that you would put something on a building that actually means something to people that you can read, and there's that debate about po postmodernism. So this was kind of modernist, modernism in a global sense, continuing, it just responds to climate. So. I'm teaching a studio for the last couple of years looking at Canadian embassies abroad and, and asking this question in an age of reconciliation is who is Canada? Who do our embassies represent? And how are Indigenous people thought of in our embassies? In fact, I visited your embassy uh, in Washington just about a month ago with my students as well. It's a great new building. But if we look at architecture of Canada, what is Canada's architecture? Our parliament building is probably the most uh, recognizable image if you ask most Canadians if that question. It's, we don't have an opera house like you do. Um, and in these embassy studios, I suddenly had this realization that this is actually an embassy because it sits on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, it's a big discussion in Canada. Is, why do we think we own that land? It was never ceded. There was never a treaty signed with the Algonquin Nation, and the Algonquin Nation considered that their territory still. So this is actually an embassy for a group of people who consider themselves Canadians on someone else's land. And even just kind of reframing that positionality with the government and the land on which it sits is kind of a jarring idea. I don't know, given your referendum, how Australians would respond to the same thing if your uh, parliament building was framed as an embassy. Identity crisis part two. This is more contemporary. So if we get over the kind of nationality uh, question, uh, you know, there's many identity crises going on, and I was going to start this one by saying that I think we're in an era where individual identity is more important than ever. You know, we were talking over dinner the other night of just social media's influence on everyone needing to create themselves, market themselves, turn yourself into a commodity. I mean, there are people making millions of dollars off of TikTok. You're selling yourself as a commodity. So that's an identity crisis, first of all. We also have many human-to-human -human crises going on right now around the world. This causes many identity crises. Which political spectrum are you on? Which re religious affiliation do you stand by? Are you going to make a statement on the next, uh, you know, uh, to make a political statement to show solidarity with something? Um, so people are being kind of peppered from all different sides these days, including architects, on where do you stand? Um, but the bigger crisis, of course, is our non-human to human relationships and our planet. And where do we sit in this? What's our identity when it comes to resource extraction? 
when it comes to damaging our planet and moving forward um, without respecting Mother Earth. So recently, people are kind of looking at the climate crisis and saying, well, this is critical regionalists are important. Frampton's term is still relevant. It's more relevant than ever, people will say. Um, but these authors in Architectural Review from a few years ago had said, Frampton's engaged theory of the discipline is more important than ever. Architecture needs a renewed frame of values in which the ground's topographic and political nature is fully recognized. And I want to highlight that not just the topographic, but the political. I think critical regionalism, I guess my point today, is that critical regionalism was very attuned to the idea of the ground as a geolo geological um, topographic space, but not from a political sense of understanding, do you know your political relationship to the land that you're standing on, where you live, where you work every day? So in my uh, embassy studio, I came across this paper as I was, you know, there's a lot of talk about relationality um, with Indigenous peoples around the world. I know in Australia you have courses I've, I've seen um, and people talk about this. This came out of the International Studies Quarterly, which I thought was quite relevant if you think about, I mean, we're starti starting to think more about our Indigenous relations as international relations. You know, if you think of our parliament building as an embassy, um, our First Nations in Canada um, are sovereign nations. So yeah, I think it's maybe there's a bit of a different culture. For many First Nations people in Canada, they don't necessarily carry Canadian passports. They don't necessarily identify with Canada. I presented at a conference once, and a woman came up to me after and said, I don't care about the Canadian embassy. That represents something else. That's not my, that's not my nation. So we are, they, they really are, are political entities of their own. Um, but this, this paper was published, and the title grabbed me. Um, just last year, this came out, What Relations Matter? And I thought, yeah. That's, that's the question we're all struggling with. We have so many things, even in a teaching design studio, how many things can a student possibly take on in their design project? It used to be you could just do a little art gallery, focus on you know, the poetics of light and materiality, but in today's schools, it's like, no, what's your political position? How's it relating to indigeneity? How are you going to fold in social uh, uh, gender issues? And it's just like more and more and more stuff, and people are feeling overwhelmed. It's like, what, what do I focus on in all of this, right? What relations matter? Um, and they frame this through this term, critical relationalism, which brought me back to this critique of critical regionalism. And I think this is where we're evolving. And I think it's not like, you know, somebody defining this and then, and then we all follow it as a kind of uh, um, uh, a new kind of direction. But I think this is organically happening around the world where people are understanding we've been neglecting this. Um, I'm just going to focus on the last paragraph here. Previous relational approaches have not sufficiently problematized their epistemological commitments, i.e., how they know which relations matter in any given instance, or alternatively, which knowledge do they rely on when thinking about relations. This is problematic because if we do not become epistemically, epistemically relational, then we fall into the trap of contextual visions even if these are relational. So thinking about critical regionalism as an architectural style, just by being, you know, creating architecture that responds to the material and vision of a place doesn't mean that you actually are tapping into the, the epistemological foundations of the place. Without the specificity of a particular relations and knowledge, we reproduce relations of inequality with the denial of its ramifications on the urban centers of the West as the grounds for racial capitalism. It matters who conceptualizes the 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 reactions we center in our analysis, our worlds, and thus which corners and issues of the world we see and problematize. It means who is the person and what knowledge base are you bringing to the table? And they conclude bringing ind indigeneity into this, that it's their starting points. The relations that they call out should be our starting points. So, when we come to climate crisis, I love this quote. I've used it multiple times. Um, this is from the former dean of forestry at Yale University, um, who said, I used to think the top global climate, uh, environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. So I've often said you can cross out scientists and put architects in there, city planners, um, whatever. People get really squirmy when you get in this space of spirituality, your spiritual relationship to the planet. 
right? We've been kind of trained to move that conversation out of mainstream sort of design culture. And unfortunately, we were warned a long time ago. This is uh, a great mentor of mine, someone who I worked with on the Venice Biennale project in 2018, Douglas Cardinal. He's a well-known Blackfoot architect and Anishinaabe elder. Uh, and he wrote this in 1977. We have, seen, we have something in our way of life, in our roots, in our heritage, that is the knowledge that surpasses that of the majority society. They have lost their affinity with the environment, while we still feel the oneness of all living things, the oneness of all life. We have a tremendous amount of knowledge to offer mankind. We must teach the industrial societies the meaning of life. And this is uh, to my point earlier where I was thanking Uncle Dave for the tremendous load of our elders and teachers around the world who are taking this on, this responsibility to share these teachings with the world. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult one, and um, they are, they're sort of um, incredible leaders. So thank you again. So how do you talk about this indigenous knowledge? This is often used as a, a teaching tool by indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world, the idea of a cultural iceberg. Um, you know, the indigenous cultural iceberg says everything you see above the, the water in this image is what you think you understand of indigenous peoples. It'll be sort of the way they look, might be their skin color, the, the physicality of them, might be their houses, their clothes, the dances they do, the music you hear, the cultural sort of expression of those people. But that expression of a group of people is pales in size in comparison to the epistemology, the knowledge base that leads to that cultural expression. And that can really only be accessed through things like ceremony, through the language, understanding the traditions of, of who you are as, as, a, as a cultural group. So when you're in Washington looking at the, at the embassies, uh, we went to the Library of Congress in Washington, and I was looking at this you know, incredible Beaux-Arts building, um, if those of you maybe have been in there. Um, and thinking about it in the context of writing you know, about this, this topic, and that this really is the tip of an iceberg. Because as you look around the ceiling, you know, it's got Voltaire and Scott and um, all the other, you know, um, canon texts of Western literature and philosophy are painted everywhere. Every, um, every sculpture has got some meaning behind it in terms of the plant and the, and the uh, putti of the, the angels and all these things that relate all the way back to Greece and Rome. And it makes you want to read everything and understand this knowledge system, right? Um, and, and you understand that this is something that you will never fully grasp within this, but there's, there's, there's this cultural um, condensa condensation here that's happening. Um, but this is also a tip of an iceberg. This is a teaching lodge in uh, Batchawana First Nation, the Ojibwe people in northern uh, Ontario, where I was with students. Uh, it may not be as grand. You may not see sculptures of, pe of uh, people from hundreds of years ago. You may not see text on here. But there's specific meaning for every single one of the uh, objects within that space. Um, there's this, this is a space of ceremony. Um, and uh, because it's not so grand, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have as big of an iceberg under the water. This, however, is alienation. This is a slide I took from a, a, a critique that Rem Koolhaas was giving of himself and others um, in, in about a decade ago at Harvard. And I loved this collage because for indigenous people, it summarizes so much. The, the kind of perverse disconnect between the ground and the building. And Koolhaas was critiquing him and other architects' work uh, from an ecological sense that there really is a disregard for where those buildings sit. Um, that idea that um, you can remove them from anywhere. So you think about the tip of the iceberg, that diagram. This is the problem where you have the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't match the underside of the water of the place. Right? It's, dis it's been displaced. And so is this, a form of alienation. So this is, in quote, indigenous architecture. Uh, this is from, as you probably can gather by the image, um, a mid-journey exercise I did at 5.06 p.m. on some random day. I put in, you know, modern design campus building expressing Cree culture. Not bad, pretty interesting. At uh, 5.08, um, that was Maori uh, campus building. At uh, 509, this is Australian Aboriginal um, buildings. And uh, at 511, I gave up because I was getting bored, and that was the Inuit uh, campus building for Northern Canada. So what is this telling us about the way the world's evolving? What is indigenous architecture if we're just going to design cool-looking indigenous buildings? We are designing buildings that sit above the water that are still totally disconnected from the land or the knowledge system underneath. <clears throat> 
And if you ask yourself, what relations matter in those buildings? Do we know as architects and designers, are you really tapping into it? Or are you trying to get a portfolio piece for your website so you can say that you are a culturally sensitive architect working in contemporary ways in, in your country or location? You know, what is the nature of a real dialogue that Rakur was talking about um, with indigenous peoples? And do we even have the capacity to get there if we can't spiritually connect to the land? Um, these are very tough questions. I don't have answers. I wish I could pass that on to you, but um, I can't. One thing I will say, so my, I have two daughters, um, kind of center of my world these days. They're eight and ten years old, but when they were a little younger, they were fascinated by, um, you know, uh, Venus flytraps. And so I ordered one from uh, Vancouver. I had to ship one out to Ontario, and I planted it in the, in the garden, and I was so happy with myself. And then it just started dying. And um, my wife was the one that came out and said, what are you doing? Like, that's way too wet for uh, that plant. So she grabbed some sand and like replanted it, and then it flourished, of course. But the idea was that, you know, every living species has a living system that makes it thrive. And if you pull it from its, its, its lifelines, it's going to die. And this is really, I'm going to talk about housing now as I shift into this. Um, uh, this is something that has been talked about by a lot. Christopher Alexander in the 1980s was looking at the production of houses. Uh, and he was writing about this idea of a colossal mismatch between the organization of decision and control and the needs for appropriateness and good adaptation within the biological reality of the housing system. And if you think of buildings, particularly houses, but also buildings as living organisms and asking yourself what lifelines they create or what they need to survive, you end up looking at the world through a different lens. So the house on the left here, it looks a lot like a lot of the ones we had driving around with Andrew the other day on the suburbs here in Melbourne, uh, very much like in Canada, but it's based off of an American suburban home. Um, and it's been a very good uh, architectural typology for millions of people for many generations uh, in, on Turtle Island, which is what we refer to as North America now. Um, but think about what it needs to thrive. First, it needs uh, clean water getting to it. It needs a sewer system. Uh, it needs a good road system so you can actually drive to your job and drop off your kids and then come home on it. Uh, it needs a roofer, probably. Uh, it needs a home hardware in case you need to do some home repairs. Uh, it needs somebody to come fix your furnace in Canada in the middle of winter in case your furnace goes down and you're not going to freeze to death. Uh, and you need space for all your vehicles and your lawnmowers and your blenders and everything else you've got to put inside there. Most importantly, what does that house need? It needs a bank that's going to give you money that you can sign up for a mortgage and then you can pay for it, and then when you're done, you sell it, and you sell it for more money than you bought it for, and then you buy your next house. And this is kind of, for many generations, the way that housing worked. It worked beautifully for mostly settler Canadians and Americans across North America. The house on the right is the same typology, and this fatal mistake that the government of Canada did is they ripped that house out of its lifelines and put it onto a reserve, sometimes in very remote locations, and said, good luck with that. First Nations people, hopefully that house suits you. And of course it didn't. There's no mortgage system, you can't own a house if you're an Indigenous person in Canada to this day. You cannot own a house on your reserve. Uh, what's your incentive for keeping up your house? And where do you go to get materials if you're in a remote location? You have no home hardware to buy things to fix up your house. And then general Canadians look at these houses and say, oh, those lazy Indians, they can't take care of anything, they're so lazy, you know, can't take care of their house. I mean, it's, it's, it's a travesty what's happened with the housing across Canada. We estimated about a $60 billion hole the government is in. And recently I heard a First Nations speaker talk about COVID. Uh, it's interesting, you know, for years, First Nations have been arguing we need to get our housing issues addressed. And they're like, well, $60 billion, you know, we just don't have that much money. Within months of COVID hitting, there were $75 billion in, put into small businesses in Canada to keep them afloat. So it's not that hard to find $60 billion. Um, it depends on what you're relations um, you're, you're prioritizing. So this is sort of at the, at the basis of uh, what we brought to the Venice Biennale this year. Um, it's, we're very, cl we're very um, clear that it's not an exhibition. This is an architectural campaign. Uh, we felt as architects very frustrated with the cost of housing, looking at what's going on across our country, that uh, to Andrew's earlier point, um, the idea of home is not a commodity. This is not something that should be exchanged to benefit more than others. And uh, in a capitalist mode, that's how capitalism works. You know, uh, some people like to say, well, the housing system is broken. But my colleague Sarah Stevens uh, worded it really well. She said, the housing system is doing great. This is exactly what the housing system was designed to do. If you don't manage 
capitalist investment in housing, this is exactly what it's supposed to do. More and more people make more money at the expense of the others. It's performing well. It needs a new system, is the problem, or at least more of a balanced one. So this is the campaign we set for. We were, we were selected to represent Canada, and one of the first things we, we did was to wrap the Canadian pavilion in this screen,、uh, which is a still photos of a tent city in Vancouver.、Um, You may not know. I mean, looking around Melbourne, I've been saying to others, I'm so impressed with sort of the economic, uh, uh, at least in the CBD, which maybe isn't very reflective. I understand, but、um, all of our cities in Canada are exploding with tent cities right now.、Um, pretty much, there isn't one major city where there isn't a major tent city. People are falling out of the housing system every day in our country,、um, and so there we were opening this,、uh, and really at the core of the of the campaign.、Um, Was we decided we wanted to do something tangible. It's one thing to just kind of you know raise your fist in the air and say this sucks, but then what do architects do? Architects can't just sit around and wave and say things suck. We have to design a better future. That's our responsibility as designers is to think forward. Think what do we? How do we address this? And so we put forth ten different demands. Each one of these demands has an architect, a housing activist, and a housing advocate. And so these are all grassroots projects that architects are helping to support.、Um, and、uh, I'm going to focus in on mine.、Uh, if there's time, we can talk about some of the others. But、uh, I'm working particularly on the First Nations home building lodges. And I want to describe this to you because it's a way. What we're trying to do is disrupt the way that housing is thought of for First Nations people in Canada. We are centered around a nonprofit group called One House Many Nations. This is a branch of a group you may have seen in your news called Idle No More.、Um, this was、uh, about 20 years ago that、uh, there was a, an indigenous group that、uh, protested against the government's treatment, and and、uh, and it turned into a massive conversation that led to many other things that I don't have time to talk about. But、um, One House Many Nations really takes this idea of what happens when communities take control of housing. On their own, and how can they promote this kind of grassroots、um, way of building? So we work with various universities, my firm, and a couple of other firms. And her community has been developing this idea of what they call a universal utility core. And briefly, what's happening to a lot of the houses in northern communities is when the mechanical systems fail.、Um, in Canada, of course, you have to heat up a home,、um, but you have it wrapped in plastic because of building envelope,、um, and you get mold problems.、Um, and a lot of those houses are not serving them well. So the idea is to take the mechanical systems and remove it as kind of a lean-to. Um, and then, um, uh, and so this was an exploration of you know how you do that. Do you put it inside the building? On how do you shape that? This was not done by myself. This is done by a decentralized de design lab. But we were tasked with you know how do you take kind of Jacob's、um, uh, diagrams and actually make this buildable. And so we did a bunch of explorations, thinking about what is this utility core? How does it relate to different kinds of houses? Um, and once we saw the budget that we had to play with,、um, we realized we had to do something very, very simple, which is a simple shed roof structure. And you can just see here how the utility core works. So we've built two prototypes of these now, and we're going to be testing them.、Um, and I won't spend much time on this. I just want to show you、uh, what this is. Again, this is not capital A architecture,、um, but what this is is rethinking the way housing works.、Uh, this is、uh, what they look like.、Um, they just were built,、uh, put on site this week, and.、Um, Uh, that's the interior,、um, but key. I know this isn't a great slide to look at, but I wanted to emphasize that key to this whole utility core thing is that in First Nations will build them themselves on their on their land with their materials, and they will be the producers. Okay, so this idea of self determination over housing starts at a small scale,、um, and it's led. By, well, it was initially led by this、um, amazing person, Dr. Alex Wilson. She's a Cree from Opaskwe Cree Nation. And、uh, she's the only person in the world that、uh, I've heard give a, a lecture on housing that starts with the cosmologies. She talks about the stars and the relationship to the forest, and then the forest to the animals, and that housing is an integrated part with all of that system.、Uh, and so I had drawn this actually a few years ago, and then she rejigged it with me, just a few little tweaks because she even called me out on my own. Bias of kind of having a, a stereotypical nuclear family in that house. Uh, and she said, you're, you're, that, "That's not an inclusive or representative of our people." So we tweaked it. But the idea here is a diagram that's trying to explain to people what a house needs to do. What are the lifelines of Cree people in the boreal forest in Canada? Very different than suburbanites. And we added the guy or the person on the ladder.、Um, that idea that they're doing it on their own.
So this is in the Venice Biennale. I'll just go through these very quickly. We put together uh, a poster for our team called Housing as Cosmology that focuses in on Opasquit Cree Nation's initiatives and talks about that idea of the interconnectedness of things to the spirit world, to the sacred fire in the center. Um, you can see that parts of this were beaded um, by indigenous people in Manitoba. So we have literally, and it's not a huge object, but many people's hands and ideas were put on this, even from a craft perspective. Um, and so this is kind of the demand that we put forth, that we demand home building design lodges tied to housing manufacturing facilities on reserve to build capacity within communities by grounding the production of houses and their components in community values, language, and education. So one of the provocations here is to say, why can't we aspire to in 30 or 40 years, or maybe 10, when you have construction documents done in Manitoba, why not have them in English and Cree? Like, why are we not able to do that yet? What, what are the barriers? Why can't a community have their elders designing their buildings with them? I'm going to skip over that. So these diagrams are sort of looking at this idea of housing as commodity, where we've kind of analyzed what is, what is the difference between an indigenous view of housing and, and a, and a non-indigenous view of housing. And it starts in even the way you term things. Uh, you know, in a commodity sense, you have a site, which is somebody's property, which has to be bought. You have a bank involved. You have uh, the house. You have builders and construction. Um, and that's sort of what leads to this. We all know the, the routine here. Um, this is uh, how it works. Um, and in a commodity sense, what happens is, so the federal government, you can see our, our uh, building that, you'd met, uh, that I showed earlier, our parliament building. What happens if you follow the money with First Nations? Um, the money ends up going to everyone else who makes the house around the First Nation, right? They don't design it. It's often some draftsperson somewhere. Then you go to all these other builders, and they often hire non-Indigenous people to build the house. So at the end of the circle, all the money's gone, and you end up with a really low-functioning house, usually, uh, for the First Nation for them to live in, and that's kind of Canada's responsibility to housing, right? Oh, yeah, we gave, you a, we gave you a house. Instead, when you look at housing as cosmology, you center home as a concept, and everything grows out of what does home mean? You know, the site is no longer a site, it's the land. It means your animals, your waters, your territories. Um, it means you as an individual, you and your with your kin, with your community? What are your responsibilities to your kin, your community? Um, and then on the outskirts of that is this idea of employment, financial capacity, land stewardship, and skills. All these other things that, you know, uh, to Elder Dave's point, Indigenous people are not artifacts of the past. They are m meaningful contributors to our society, you know? So employment and skills training is very important. Um, so we rewire that diagram and try to get rid of that loop around the house and actually put the money directly to the, the design lodge. And we're designing, we're not really designing the design lodge, this is a concept, but to say what happens when you put the money for the housing and the conceptualization of the housing in the hands of the elders on reserve and you open up all the barriers to them, for them to make their own housing out of their own land materials, um, and then they can pull from the outside as they need, but they're in control fiscally of their des destiny in terms of housing. And then you kind of place it within the community to say, you know, how does this land within a community um, and how does this relate to other infrastructures? So one thing we're trying to look at within our First Nations communities is if you center design and building as another key component as education, social services, your fire department, you know, most reserves have their own social systems already in place, but building and design is not there because for decades and generations, it's been a very paternalistic relationship with the government. You know, all the buildings on reserves are just, they show up one day, and someone else builds them. Um, so we're really trying to look at this idea of what is a grassroots um, housing infrastructure work for First Nations peoples. Um, I want to, oh, okay, this is a, I guess I'm going to end there. I had added some other slides, but um, this is a drawing that we did for the Biennale, which is on the other uh, wall, and um, it just kind of tries to capture this spirit. And so I guess uh, as, I ra as I wrap up, I just wanted to um, maybe go home today and think about, you know, when it comes to the land that you live on, uh, going to understand, you know, how did you get here? I, I taught a course last year called the Architectures of Reconciliation, and the main assignment was to ask the students, to go home and write an essay on how did you come to this land? And many of them ended up um, interviewing their grandparents, for instance, going back in their family trees. Many of our, our white students had this shocking realization that, you know, their ancestors had actually taken massive amounts of land from 
indigenous peoples, and this is why they were actually able to go to university today on the backs of all of those things. So, you know, I think in Canada, when we come to our land acknowledgements, and one of the things that's emerging more and more is to just ask people, you know, not just acknowledge whose land you're on, but what is your political relationship to that land, and what's your responsibility as a professional moving forward? So I will say thank you. Merci.